Hey folks, how's it going? So, if you don't know me, my name is Jay. Um, on this channel, we do speaker reviews, amplifier reviews, um, and stuff like this. I'm just coming out from working at home. Um, just got some job done. And so now I'm going to go down and make some coffee, but I wanted to talk to you guys about some of the influential speakers that I've experienced um, in the time of my journey, because I think that's very important to, for, you, for you guys to understand where I come from and what I've experienced and what kind of sound um, I'm used to and enjoy um, and what has impacted me to you know, uh, kind of review the things the way I do and stuff like that. So um, anyways, I'm gonna go down and make some coffee right now and we'll go to my listening room and talk more. So I have my coffee, now I'm happy. And we're back. Uh, we're in my listening space right now. And so let's talk about the uh, speakers that was influential to me. Um, the first speaker that really comes to my mind is the MagnaPen 0.7i. And this is when I was first introduced to speakers in general. I was always a, always a headphone guy. And as you guys know, this channel started with headphone reviews. And I really, really loved headphones. I really loved what they can do. Um, and one of the most ama amazing things about headphones that I really liked was the fact that, you know, um, open back headphones threw this sound stage at me that um, kind of mimicked as if it was coming from a TV or a source that's outside of the head. And that was really fascinating. And then I got introduced to speakers. And then of course I was more fascinated. And my life was totally changed obviously because that was a totally different experience. Um, that was like a totally different thing. It was obviously out of the head, but the sound stage was in front of me and not, you know, just kind of here. It was literally, uh, you know, a much bigger sound stage than any headphone can handle uh, or provide. So I was um, obviously blown away and I was uh, uh, all for it. Now, one thing about um, coming from headphones to speakers I, in a lot of cases is the fact that, uh, quite frankly, when you go to speakers, it seems that um, the sound characteristic is much different from coming from a headphone to a speaker. I don't know exactly how to explain, but the MagnaPen sound signature in a lot of ways uh, kind of sounded like a headphone kind of sound signature to me at the time. And so I went and bought a po uh, 0 0.7, MagnaPen 0.7 um, at the time. And I started pairing up with um, a lot of amplifiers. And it was a really good lesson for me because that speaker was uh, it needed a specific type of amplifier. As you guys know, it's hard to find amplifiers that match magnet pens perfectly. And this was a great example and great um, kind of lesson for me to learn with this first speaker that I had. So I played with, around with the placement. Um, I, in the beginning, I had no idea about placement or how to place the speakers really. But just being with the magnet pen 0.7i, I was able to learn a lot. And that was a fascinating speaker. It was open sounding. It was a panel design. Um, it, it, it was, I, I believe they make the 0.7i now. And so that was a fascinating speaker. Now they have the MagnaPen LRS now, which I didn't have at the time. But if it did exist at the time, I don't think I, I would have hesitated buying the LRS uh, as my first speaker. So in the beginning, I thought MagnaPen, great. I had great amplifiers with it. I had uh, Meitner monoblocks with it. And then I eventually bought Name. And I thought it was, you know, be and end all. It was fascinating. Uh, it was great for a bit of time. But again, the upgrade itch or bug, um, I should say, bit me. And so I wanted to upgrade and I wanted to see what I can get more from another type of speaker. And at the time, the only speaker that really, really fascinated me was the Wilson Audio Sabrina. Now, the Wilson Audio Sabrina is a big jump from the MagnaPen 0.79. The MagnaPen 0.79 is around um, 2,500-ish 2, Canadian uh, here in Canada. And um, the Sabrina, Wilson Audio Sabrina, was, I believe, uh, $21,000 in Canadian dollars in Canada at the time. So obviously that was a big jump. But the reason the Wilson Audio Sabrina was fascinating to me was because for one thing, it had dynamics that the, uh, the magnet pants couldn't provide. It had that, uh, that kind of authority in the bottom end, the rumble, the kick, um, the, the, the way the drum was hitting. Uh, the, and, and yet it had transparency, it had 
high frequency extension, much like the uh, MagnaPan's open. Um, and so I really like that speaker. It sounded, it projected to me in an emotional sense. And so obviously I couldn't afford that. And even if it came on a used market for half the price or, you know, I got a really great deal, it was still a ridiculous amount of money for me at the time. It was just not feasible. I didn't even have that much money in my bank account. Now that's kind of embarrassing admitting that I didn't have that much money uh, in my bank account. But anyways, I went ahead and looked for other alternatives. And at the time, a very good friend of mine who was working uh, at the store rec recommended me, and he's still a good friend of mine, but he recommended me the JBL L300. And um, he owned it personally. And so he recommended me that speaker because he said that in a lot of ways that Sabrina um, and the JBL L300 has similarities that I am describing to him that um, you know, I like. So I went ahead with the JBL L300. I, I took, me, took me months to find one in a good shape because um, aesthetics matter to me. So this is a vintage speaker. So this is the first vintage speaker in, in, the, in the entire you know, video that I'm talking about. It's the JBL L300. And this speaker was fascinating to me. Um, I bought it for around five grand Canadian at the time. I drove all the way to the seller's house and um, I paid him five grand in cash. Uh, I put, we put one in my car and one in his truck. Um, it was that big of a speaker and I brought it in. So when I first got the speakers, I put them in the biggest space I had and that was my basement. And quite frankly, my basement was not even finished. So it was an unfinished basement. I put them in the basement and I played them. No acoustic panels, um, didn't have a clue about them at the time. Well, I did, but I didn't bother. And I played it with uh, the Meitner MA1, not MA1, Meitner uh, MTR 101 uh, monoblocks, which are also vintage, designed by Ed Meitner, um, the famous engineer. And then, so I played it and I really liked it, but it was just a tad bright for me. And perhaps because of the acoustics of the basement, um, even though the acoustic in the basement was quite good, it did have hard reflecting walls. So what I ended up doing was going and getting it myself a set of tube amplifiers and that really did it for me. Um, I got the uh, Macintosh vintage MC60s and MC30 monoblocks. I tried them both. I liked the MC30s a little bit better and the 60s had its own characteristics. Anyways, that's the amplifier section, so I won't get, get into it too much, but it was a beautiful match, and I just love that system so very much. So what the JBL L300 did was that it was very dynamic, just like the Sabrina. Um, it projected in a way that was large. The soundstage was stretching out. It didn't quite image as you would from a, uh, from a point source speaker, but it was more of a, um, in a horn-loaded mid-range, right? So the, the sound was gutty, it had authority to it, it was dynamic. The highs and the bottom was, um, was full sounding. Um, it didn't have any kind of, kind of you know, uh, brightness to it when you had the right adjustments, like the tube amplifiers, for example. And I think that a lot of the people out there can agree with me on that if you have owned some of the JBL speakers. Now the next speaker um, I went to, and I, after this, you know, I didn't sell my JBL, JBL L300s for a long time, but my you know, bug bit me again upgrade bug. At one time, and this upgrade bug was so bad that, uh, you know, I ended up with 60 pairs of speakers in my basement. That's a lot of speakers. Now, that's a whole other story, but out of those speakers, I wanted to touch upon some of the speakers that influenced me the most in terms of kind of opening my eyes to things and saying, aha, that's what's different about this speaker, this type of speaker. So, the Quad ESL 63. Now we're jumping into a whole different category and this is an electrostatic uh, speaker. I heard a lot of different things about this speaker and I wanted to hear them for myself. I heard from people that you know it sounded really good with only certain recordings. I heard from some people that it's just absolute trash. I heard from some people that just said only good things about it. I uh, had nothing but good things to say about it. So what I ended up uh, doing was buying this pair of, mag uh, not MagnaPan, sorry, Quad ESL63s. Now, the problem with Quad is that I had to take a big risk because um, the, quite frankly, if the panels break down, then the cost to rebuild it is tremendous. So I had to really take a bargain and I bought a pair of speakers. Thankfully, this pair was good. So I bought myself the Quad amplifier and preamplifier. Also, I had the Quad um, 
two, I believe, the, the tube amplifier that goes with the quad, uh, quad speakers. And so I had I played around with multiple gear, but what at the end of the day, what that speaker did was not something that no other speakers do. And that's take, take out totally the vocal sibilance area. So for example, when I go right, the kind, those kind of sibilance is totally removed from the speaker. So when I was listening to modern tracks, when I was listening to tracks that I had trouble with in the past playing uh, on, on normal speakers or even, my, even on my JBL um, L300s, where the sibilance, the S was very strong or was bothering me a little bit, it didn't have any of that in the actual uh, playback with the quad ESL 63s. But what that kind of did was, you know, guys, it's funny because I liked it at first because it didn't have that kind of uh, sibilance and it didn't bother me one bit. But it got boring very, very quickly because yes, certainly it sounded only good with certain type of music. And when the music got a little bit more complicated or uh, I wanted some more air or more uh, definition to the sound of the vocals, that didn't come to come through with both speakers. But instrumentals like saxophones, violins, and stuff like that, even vocals, sounded really great with those speakers. Um, now after that, what ended up happening was I got the ESL 57s and I got the first two and then I got the stack versions. And that speaker was quite interesting to me because it had dynamics. Um, unlike the ESL 63s, it did have dynamics in some sense and it did have the vocal characteristics very similar to the ESL 63. And it was influential to me, the quad speakers in general, the, the 57 and the 63, both were very influential to me because it gave me an idea of how different a speaker can sound compared to the Magnapans, uh, compared to the JBLs, compared to the uh, Wilson Audio Sabrinas. It was a totally different presentation. Now after that, I had this confusion in my head thinking to myself, okay, well I thought panel speakers were supposed to sound transparent like Magnapans. Well, that's not the case. Quads d did sound transparent, but it didn't have that kind of definition or um, sibilance like a real life performance in a way. So I was thinking to myself, okay, now I need to test other planar magnetic or electrostatic speakers. So I got the uh, um, Martin Logan speakers. I got the ESL-X and that threw a very transparent sound, much like Magna Pants, but even more cleaner and crispier. And the uh, imaging was quite interesting on that speaker because the imaging was just big. If you had, um, imagine a singer with a big head. Imagine your favorite singer with, with its big head and big mouth and it's like a giant. That's what it seemed like when it came to imaging. So the Martin Logan ESL X uh, really did tell me, you know, well, panels do sound transparent. In some cases, even panels can be tweaked to sound in a certain way. It all ends up being the designer's goal. It's not so much about the material or, or the things. Of course, those things matter, but at the end of the day, even a metal dome tweeter can sound soft if the designer is intended and, you know, for the lack of better words, dampens the shit out of it. Or a soft dome tweeter can sound sharp or bright in some cases if, you, if, the, if the designer designed it in such a way to um, um, make that happen. And I found this out on my journey. It was not so much about just looking at the damn speaker and thinking to myself, oh, that's gonna sound bright because it has a metal dome tweeter. I had this misguided representation of things because I was not experienced enough. But once you do listen more, and I hope, I hope since I'm reviewing things, I have listened to a lot of things and I want to say that I listened to a lot of things, but I also want to say that admittedly, I haven't heard, you know, everything. So I just want to sidetrack here and tell you guys, you know, don't, judge a book by its cover. Don't look at a soft dome speaker and say, oh, that's gonna sound soft, rolled off. Or don't look at a metal dome tweeter and say, you know, that's gonna sound sharp as hell, it's gonna be bright. Or, you know, look at a panel speaker and say the same thing. So, um, at the end of the day, it taught me that. And I think that was a very valuable lesson to learn when it came to speakers. Now, moving on from that, I went crazy. I bought, I bought the JBL 4311. Um, just to listen to Billie Jean uh, by Michael Jackson. Now, I was, a huge I was a huge fan of Michael Jackson, okay? And I read in a book that I was studying um, that 
the JBL 4311 was used in the mastering mixing of the Billie Jean by Michael Jackson. And so I bought the 4311 just to hear the Billie Jean. But man, that speaker was fantastic. It kicked ass. The paper woofers were just fantastic. Just fast, natural sounding. Um, JBL made really, really damn good speakers. Now, another crazy thing that I did was buy the Altec um, um, theater, uh, voice of the theater speaker, um, A A7, I believe. And this thing was a whole another story of craziness because this thing was gigantic. It was bigger than my JBLs. Um, it came here and it went quickly because it was just way too big. I had to, it couldn't fit through my front door, so I had to actually open up my backyard, take out the, um, the windows, and bring it in. So I went crazy with it. And I it took four guys, including some of my friends, to bring it downstairs to my basement. And once I brought it down to the basement, I quickly realized that this thing didn't have any deep bass. In fact, it kind of rolled off around like 100, below 100 hertz, 80 hertz, something like that. And so I had to find you know, a different way to make the speaker work. And so I made a mistake of adding subwoofers. I, I, I tried to make bass happen with the speaker because it did have this 15 inch woofer that was home loaded. Okay, the tweeter was home loaded, the woofer was home loaded, and you know, I thought to myself, a 15 inch woofer and no bass. How is that freaking possible? So I tried to add in a subwoofer and that didn't work as well as I would thought it would. Um, I tried everything, electronic crossovers. Now some of it, it made, it made improvements, but it was not the Altec sound per se was never intended to be used in that kind of way. And later I found out that pairing these with a proper set of tube amplifiers that sounded warm, um, luscious, um, the quads worked well with it, the quad two amplifiers worked well with it. And when I paired it up, I realized that the vocals, the mid range was what it was all about, not necessarily the bass. And so, um, you know, that taught me that certain speakers are meant to be, you know, certain things. Just because it has a 15 inch woofer doesn't mean it's gonna create massive bass. Again, I was deceived by the looks. And sometimes it's all about the high frequency and the mid range and never about the bass. Sometimes it's about the bass. Sometimes it's about all being an all rounder. But sometimes I get questions from you guys and I get questions from my friends saying, okay, so this speaker has bass. How about the mid range and the high frequency? Can it compare to, for example, the Altex, which is known for its high frequency and mid range? And I often, my answer is no. If it does bass well, then the mid range and the high frequency is technically not going to be as good as the Altec or something that is meant for mid range and high frequency because it was designed in a such a way that the concentration was it to be an all rounder or concentrated more on the bass not so much on the mid-range and the high frequency. Now, of course, the mid-range, the high frequency, and the bass, it can be all great, and it can match your taste perfectly. But that's a whole different story because then you're talking about maybe a different price point or based on taste. So that's what the Altex taught me. Big speaker, no bass. And that was quite interesting of a journey. Now, aside from the JBLs, I've also experienced Tannoy speakers, Tannoy, um, you know, uh, dual concentric speakers, the gold, the red. Now those are very expensive, but at the time when I was doing it, it was still expensive, but it was affordable. Now it's outright, um, you know, crazy prices now. But I had um, a lot of these speakers. I, ha I heard the corner autograph um, speakers uh, and it was great. It was fantastic. The sweet sound, uh, the great imaging of dual concentrics, Again, it had its own compromises. There's always compromises. Now, the LS35A was a BBC monitor. It was used when you know um, BBC was monitoring their audio, basically in a kind of minivan, uh, broadcasting minivan, and so it was meant to be put in a very tough situations and have really good vocal reproduction. Now, it became famous in the audio world because they had this you know 15 ohm version, 11 ohm version from you know different periods of production. And they had this really tight control of the uh, 
um, expectation and specs of, of the unit because they knew that it had to be you know the same thing they're hearing anywhere they go and so audiophiles went crazy over the badge the gold badge the silver badge and it became like a collection piece and now it's a lot uh, more expensive but at the time it was like $200 or something like that now unfortunately you know because of my age my young age obviously I didn't get get it for $200 I never had the chance to now I bought it for around two grand my first pair of LS3 5A's um, and I think that was a pretty good price it was a very uh, you know great shape 15 ohm version which is the preferred version but later on I've tried the 11 ohm version as well also the re um, the uh, reissued Falcon LS35A uh, and the um, audio space LS35A as well so they've been re reborn um, and they're currently making it but when the at the time where nobody nobody was making it it became like a you know like a legendary piece you know and, and you can't get it anywhere else so you have to buy used so I, I bought it um, and mine was Rogers but you know there was a Chartwell version which was more expensive now it was more of more or less a collection piece but the reason people audiophiles liked it so much was because first of all it had really good imaging and it had really good um, you know vocal vocal presence to it uh, really good for vocals obviously and you know it had this warmth to it that a lot of people liked but that's not what I want to talk about with the LS35A right now what I want to talk about is the placement now the LS35A traditionally and the way that um, I've been taught to set it up and the way I set it up and the way I thought I thought to be uh, sounding best was when I had them in an extreme tilt and I've never done that before. So aside from the great characteristics, the tonal and, and the vocal presentation of the LS35A, what it taught me was that, you know, um, and of course a sealed design, right? So it was a sealed speaker. So that was very interesting when it came to the uh, bass, res bass response as well. But what that speaker really taught me at the end of the day was that the placement of the speaker is different for every speaker. So you have to really play around with it. And it's not like, you know, your friend is tilting the speakers, you know, their speakers, right? Let's say they have the Bocard S400 and they're tilting it towards their shoulders or their ears. Doesn't mean that you you have to do that with your speakers, which, you know, unless you have the same type of speakers and you agree with him, right? If you have the LS35A, don't follow your friend who has a Bocard uh, with the you know, amount of tilt. You have to try it for yourself. And let's say your friend has the same type of speaker and he likes to tilt it towards his ears. Maybe you like to have the extreme tilt with your speakers, even though you have the damn same speakers. Because you listen differently in a different environment with different equipment. So at the end of the day, what that speaker taught me was that placement with every speaker is different and I have to play around with it. That's why my review process takes quite a bit of time because I need to find the right placement and um, that works with the speaker and I do report back to you guys how I had it set up. Now I'm probably leaving out a lot of speakers here because I went through a lot and I want to tell you guys more about it. Maybe I'll make a part two version of this if you guys would like me to leave it down in the comment section. But um, I'm gonna move, on, move ahead in time and come to the metal larks. So the metal lark speakers um, I bought them not too, re uh, not, not too long ago. Before this whole pandemic happened with the coronavirus, I bought the Metal Larks. And the Metal Lark um, hot rod version, I believe it's the Sherons. Um, I will link, I'll put it here if it's a different model. But I bought this speaker. And this speaker was at the time retailing for around two grand, I believe. And there was the hot rod version, which was the um, higher quality version and then there was the lesser version. Now the hot rod version sold like crazy. And so there's few if you look in the market that you can purchase, but it's really hard to find. And it just looks like a plain darn speaker. If you were to look in the market and just go off to buy the looks, this is a plain darn vintage speaker. And you would look at it and go like, what? I'm not gonna pay you know $1,000 or $800 for that. But that's what they go for in the used market currently. Um, they may have gotten a little bit more expensive since, since then. Now I bought this speaker and I placed them and the first thing I noticed was that this speaker images really, really well, perfectly. The imaging is right there in the middle. She was right there in my listening space. Um, the singer's voice was right there. But it didn't do the deep, deep bass. The bass was fast, but it was also not the fastest that I've listened to. Um, it was just mediocre in terms of the bass response. 
And then when it comes to the mid range, that's where it really shined. It was imaging perfectly. Their instruments, uh, their instrumentals had great tonality to it. Um, the high frequency extension was just, just you know, perfect at least for me. But to a lot of people that's coming from let's say vocals or a little bit brighter presentation of speakers will find it less exciting and perhaps even boring. And sound staging, if you're coming from like, you know, holographic kind of sound, then you may even want to add tube amplifiers or tube preamplifiers or, or to make it more holographic of a presentation. But that would be, you know, maybe depending on the component, of course, uh, maybe, you know, at the sacrifice of the perfect imaging that's coming from these speakers. Now, I've tried this with a tube amplifier called the Wilsonton. I've tried it with the Hagels. I've tried it with um, the first watt from Nelson Pass. I've tried it with the uh, Paris Sound. And, and in, a lot, in most cases, the imaging was just fantastic, but the sound stage wasn't the biggest, okay? Um, the bass wasn't the deepest or the fastest, right? So that's what I want you to take away. Now, imaging to me in a lot of ways uh, sometimes are very important to me with certain music because I want that perfect imaging in the middle without being sharp or bright. But that's what the speaker is really about. That's what the speaker is really, really good at doing. And that's enough because if you're a person that's looking for that, there you go. You found it. But in a lot of cases, uh, you know, me or some other people and even m maybe you can't be just satisfied with one type of sound and maybe ch uh, purchasing or, or chasing after a different type of sound every other month, every other year, you know, who knows. But that's the beauty of it. Don't be frustrated when it comes to, you know, upgrading your system or trying to find new things that you want to add or take away from your system because at the end of the day, that tells you exactly what you want and sometimes what you want change. And sometimes you realize that you can't not get what you want from a one system or one type of speaker. And that's why a lot of people have more than one type of speaker. So now this video is becoming a little bit too long, so I'm gonna cut it short now. My coffee's getting cold. Um, but I may make a part two version of this video. Now lastly, I want to say that the Tecton Double Impact as the modern day speaker has been a new experience for me as well as the Bacard S400. Those two speakers are fantastic speakers. And those speakers really, really speak to me in a different way. It is modern, yet it has ties to the vintage world in certain aspect of the sound from what, where I'm coming from. And it shows me improvement. It shows me improvement in the steps from vintage to current. And there's a tie there. It's not like modern day speakers where it's like, okay, we're gonna do everything different. We're gonna make it shouty as possible or bright as possible, detailed as possible. No, it's about the musicality and being an all-rounder that's very good for the price and affordable for average Joes like you and me. So thank you guys so much for spending time here today and listening to me talk about my influential speakers. I hope you guys are staying safe and I'll see you guys on the next one.